One of the most overlooked sources of error in a total station measurement can come from the tripod the instrument is set up on. All too often our tripods are left out in the elements, tossed in the back of a truck to rattle around with the shovels and stakes, and the fasteners that hold everything together are forgotten about to work themselves loose. We rely on our tripods to hold our instrument steady with an extremely small tolerance for movement, yet they are often not treated with the same level of care as some of our more delicate pieces of equipment. The orientation of the top plate of the tripod and thus the total station deviates causing error for several reasons. When a total station rotates either by the internal motors of a robotic total station or the instrument person manually rotating it, rotational forces are applied that torque and distort the top plate and the tri bracket that's secured to it causing it to move minuscule amounts, often settling in a slightly different position than where it was prior to the rotational force that was applied. An increase or decrease in temperature causes the tripod to expand and contract, and since the tripod is made up of several different materials, it's not going to expand and contract uniformly. The static weight of a motionless instrument can cause horizontal drift, surprisingly quickly depending on what the tripod is made from. And improperly adjusted tripod fasteners have a tendency to exacerbate these three sources of error from the tripod. Today I will be going over a couple of studies that dive into this subject, and since I can't sit back and let the universities have all the fun, I did some testing of my own that we'll explore as well. The torsional rigidity of a surveying tripod can be described as its ability to absorb a rotational force and return to its original position after the force ceases to be applied. The precision to which the tripod orientation returns to the original position is often referred to as hysteresis. Hysteresis has a direct influence on the angular accuracy of the total station. So much so that ISO, or the International Organization of Standardization, actually has a standard specification that governs tripods for surveying instruments. ISO 12858-2 explicitly states how much of this error is allowable for a tripod to be ISO compliant. There are two classifications for the ISO standard, type L for lightweight, meant for small instruments, and type H, which is meant for heavy instruments. For a tripod to meet ISO standards for either classification, there is a long list of requirements that it must possess. Some of the more important ones being they must be built to a defined dimension and weight, they must be able to support an instrument of a certain weight, 15 kilograms for a heavy tripod and five kilograms for a light. They are only allowed a set amount of high hysteresis depending on designation, three seconds of angular error or less for the heavy designation, and up to 10 seconds is permitted for the light designation. And when loading the tripod with double the allowable maximum instrument weight, it must not deform vertically more than 0.05 millimeters. The first study we are going to look at comes from the Department of Geodesy Engineering out of the Technical University of Vienna. Six different tripods were used in the testing procedure, three from the heavy designation and three from the light designation. All of the tests were performed in stable laboratory conditions to achieve the most consistent possible comparison and all tripod fasteners were tightened with the same force using a torque wrench. Only brand new tripods were used and they went as far as using two of each type of tripod to ensure there weren't skewed results due to a manufacturing defect of a particular tripod. Three separate tests were run. The first was testing the height stability according to the ISO parameters. Two times the maximum allowable weight that each tripod was designed to carry was loaded on the head of the tripod and the vertical deflection was monitored. 100 height measurements were made to the tripod prior to the weight being added and then 30 kilograms was slowly lowered onto each heavy tripod via a pulley system, and then another 400 measurements were made. The duration of each measurement scheme was 35 minutes. 
The following graph shows the results of those tests. All three heavy tripods were within spec, with the fiberglass Trimax being at the very limits of the spec and even crossing the threshold momentarily. The Trimax tested only had quick clamps, which may have been the cause for the worst vertical performance. The light tripods were all loaded with 10 kilograms and the same testing methodology was performed. All three light tripods were well within spec hovering between 0.02 and 0.03 millimeters. One could look at these results and note the Trimax performed twice as poorly as its Leica counterparts and draw some conclusions based on that. But let's keep things in perspective when looking at these numbers. Even with twice as much weight loaded onto each tripod than the maximum it was designed to carry, the vertical deformation was only 0.05 millimeters. That's the width of a human hair. If I set up an instrument and it only sank a hair width over 35 minutes, I'm not complaining too much. And the fact that the Trimax only settled that much with quick clamps is pretty impressive to be honest. The study also noted that the amount of settlement observed had no significant impact on a total station's vertical angular measurement. The next test that was performed tested the torsional rigidity or hysteresis of each tripod. A robotic total station was mounted on each tripod, both light and heavy, and an electric collimator was used to track the rotational movement of both the tripod head and the tribrac separately relative to the instrument while the robot continually ran rounds of observations for three minutes. The collimator was making observations at a rate of 16 hertz or 16 measurements per second. The following graph highlights the results of the test for the heavy tripods. The data spikes denote when the instrument was moving and can be ignored as no angular measurement is made when the total station is in motion. The fiberglass Trimax had a larger amplitude of rotational movement in the tripod head that could induce as much as 3 seconds of air whereas the wooden Leica tripods both had less at 2 seconds of hysteresis measured. The Tribrax used showed an additional one second of potential horizontal angular air being introduced. Even under perfect laboratory conditions where brand new tripods were used in environmentally controlled conditions with some of the best tripods money can buy, we are still seeing three to four seconds of potential additional angular air being introduced. I would like to take a minute to reflect on that. We are talking about some significant air under optimal conditions. And remember, this is just one of the many sources of angular air that can creep into our total station measurements, and often a forgotten one. So when you're trying to calculate the setup accuracy of a half-second instrument, just keep in mind there is far more to that calculation than the angular spec of the instrument. Hence why forced centering concrete pillars are fairly common when high accuracy is required. It's not uncommon for a large-scale construction project to have their primary survey control on either concrete or steel pipe piles that were installed for that very purpose. The third test performed was determining the change in horizontal orientation over time due to drift caused purely by the weight of a static instrument. This parameter does not have a set ISO spec so manufacturers don't have to test for it, but that being said it can add a significant amount of error depending on the tripod material if ignored. A total station was set on each tripod and left motionless for three hours and the change in orientation was measured at a rate of one measurement every two seconds. Any deviation this time was caused strictly by the weight of the motionless total station unlike the torsional rigidity test where the change in orientation was caused by the rotational force of the total station motor. As one would expect, the apparent change in orientation happened over a greater length than time. The results of this test were the most surprising to me, and the difference between the wooden tripod and the fiberglass tripod were quite significant. The two wooden tripods had a fairly linear change in orientation, one of which saw 2.3 seconds over 3 hours, and the other saw 1.3 seconds over 3 hours. 
but the fiberglass tripod saw four seconds of deviation in only 20 minutes. And remember, this isn't four seconds of error caused by the instrument sinking into soft ground that the compensator would theoretically help clean up. All of this testing was performed on concrete and the height stability test showed next to no vertical settlement. This was caused by horizontal drift. So what can we gather from this? Well, if we look at the graph of the change of orientation over time for the fiberglass tripod, we can see that it really leveled out after 20 minutes. Based on these results, a recommendation could be made that if one were using a fiberglass tripod or any tripod for that matter, and is performing a high accuracy survey, it would be in their best interest to set up, level the instrument first, then start performing other necessary tasks, setting up the backsight, prepping notes, taking field pictures for 20 plus minutes to allow the tripod to settle and stop drifting before re-leveling with the tribrac and setting their backsight orientation. The tests performed at the Vienna Institute were all conducted in a temperature and humidity controlled environment, which is great for isolating the influences that they were trying to test for. But since we rarely operate our instruments inside in temperature controlled environments, it would also be beneficial for us to know how temperature affects our tripods and how that subsequently introduces angular air into our total station measurements. Luckily for us, the Faculty of Geodesy and Cartography out of the Warsaw University of Technology included such testing in their study titled Stability Tests of the TCRP1201 Plus Total Station Parameters and its Setup. They set up three different tripods in an outdoor environment that saw temperature fluctuations of up to 23 degrees Celsius and the setup point was not shielded from sunlight. Both tilt readings and changes in orientations were measured over a time span of three days. They saw a very clear correlation between temperature change and deviation in orientation for each different type of tripod. The author of the study noted that even though there were significant changes in the tilt of the tripod head, they were still within the bounds of what the level compensator could correct for. They also found the composite tripod made of fiberglass and wood had the lowest error of influence from temperature deviation. However, and I quote, the character of changes in tripod geometry depend not only on the type of material used for its manufacture, but also it is to a large extent an individual characteristic of a particular unit. That being said, and given that only one tripod of each type was used, with no mention of if these were new units or the condition of each, it would be difficult to conclusively say that a composite tripod should outperform a wooden tripod with respect to air due to temperature variation. What we can draw from this study is that temperature fluctuation does have a clear and perceptible influence on the air introduced on the orientation of a total station from the tripod it's set up on. We just can't say exactly how much change in temperature causes how many arc seconds of air as there are just too many variables in this study. My recommendation would be, as the temperature starts to rapidly increase in the morning, you should make a habit of checking and resetting your orientation at smaller time intervals to begin with, and adjust that time span based on what you're seeing. If you're rechecking your backsight every 30 minutes and seeing a deviation of 10 plus seconds, for example, it would be a good idea to drop that interval down to say every five to 10 minutes. If the temperature change starts to level off around noon and you're not seeing as much change in orientation on your five to 10 minute backsight checks, you may start to think about increasing that time interval of your checks to every 15 minutes. Tripods aren't the only piece of equipment susceptible to high hysteresis. Tribrax, the other connection point between the instrument and the ground are susceptible to this air source as well. Many, if not all, tribrac manufacturers make tribracs in varying levels of quality. For example, Leica has three different grades of tribrac, the Professional 5000, 3000, and 1000 series, where the 5000 is guaranteed to a high hysteresis of no more than one second, and the 1000 is guaranteed to a high hysteresis of up to five seconds. Most robotic total stations would be equipped with the top tier level of tribracs, 
but it's not out of the realm of possibility that someone unknowingly swapped a lesser quality tribrac onto a total station at some point in its life. It's recommended to check and make sure you have a tribrac that won't impose unnecessary error based on the accuracy you're hoping to achieve. Both the Vienna Institute and the Warsaw University of Technology did a fantastic job with their testing, but there was another situation I wanted to explore as well. I wanted to know what effect fastener tension would have on angular accuracy. Our tripods get loose over time with use and it's not uncommon that the fasteners that secure the tripod plate to the legs aren't as tight as they should be. Unfortunately, I didn't have the precise measurement devices that the universities had to measure drift and hysteresis. So instead I had to settle for taking a series of measurements when the tripod fasteners were appropriately tightened and a series when they were loose. To test what effect this had on angular measurements, I set up a total station on concrete in the shade and acclimatized and measured the angle between two points 20 times over 20 minutes when the tripod fasteners were secured in such a way that when I lifted the leg of the tripod to the horizon, it would either just stay up or very slowly lower itself down and the tension clamps were set to be tight to a point where there was significant resistance to clamp the legs, but not too much where there is any concern of damaging the clamping mechanism. I then repeated the same measurements when the fasteners were loosened to a point where the legs could freely swing as they wanted and the tension clamps were relatively easy to close, but I could still put my full body weight on the tripod head without any obvious slipping in the legs. This would represent a tripod not properly adjusted but the level of slop in the tripod was by no means worse than what could be possible by neglecting to pay attention to the tripod fastener tension. After I crunched the numbers and compared the residuals of the angle measurements from the data set with the tripod properly tightened to the residuals when the tripod head was loose, there was a measurable difference, but it was quite a bit smaller than what I was expecting to see, to be honest. 26 of the 40 measurement sets had a measured horizontal angle residual of more than one second. Nine of those were from the data set with the properly adjusted tripod and 15 were from the data set with the loosened tripod head. Nine out of the 10 measurement sets with the lowest residuals were from the data set with the properly adjusted tripod and eight out of the 10 measurement sets with the worst residuals were from the loose legs. It is fairly clear that the data sets with a properly adjusted tripod were of higher quality, but it wasn't a night and day difference. So what can we take home from all this information? There really aren't any great revelations from all these different tests, but it should more so be a reminder that tripod choice does matter. Use either a composite tripod or an all wooden tripod if you want the highest accuracy level possible. Only use Type H or ISO designated heavy tripods for total station work. If there is no data plate on the tripod denoting its designation, you can probably make a fairly accurate guess on what kind of tripod it is just by how much it weighs. A general rule of thumb is if it's over 15 pounds, it's probably a Type H. And if it's 10 pounds or less and feels kind of flimsy, it's probably a Type L. If possible, set up your instrument and then do some busy work while you wait for the tripod to settle before beginning to take measurements. Don't set up and sit there on your phone for 20 minutes, but if you have work that needs to be done regardless, do it during that waiting period. And I usually set up my instrument first, then set up my back sight, prep my field notes, take setup pictures, and then take my measurements. There is often the thought that quick clamps do not have sufficient holding power to reduce leg settlement to a negligible level. The Vienna testing found this not to be the case. If there are large temperature fluctuations happening, take that into account when determining how often to recheck your orientation. Tribracks come in varying levels of quality. Make sure you have the right tribrack for the level of accuracy you are hoping to achieve. And keep your tripod fasteners properly adjusted. You should have an Allen key or socket in your truck with you that adjusts your tripod fasteners. That wraps up another Surveying 101 video. In the next video in this series, we will look at the difference between grid and ground coordinates and when to use each. Thank you for watching and as always, subscribe if you want, like if you feel it's warranted, and I'll see you next time.